All right. So Perlier Creek Restoration for Trout Habitat at Rendezvous Mountain State Forest. So this uh, presentation was given to me by uh, Dr. Greg Jennings. Uh, and this is a project that I worked on at North Carolina State University and then while at Stantec uh, with Brad and, and so forth. There was multiple partners in this project. Um, and this project was located in Northern North Carolina uh, right on the edge of an eco region uh, that has really marginal potential for brook trout. Uh, but this was high enough in elevation and they thought that if um, there was a potential that if this stream could be restored that they could get cold water fisheries in here or in eastern brook trout. Uh, they also wanted to improve water quality by reducing sediment and nutrients and they wanted to provide educational opportunities for landowners and restoration professionals. Problems were there were perch culverts, stream bank erosion, uh, cattle access, um, poor riparian buffers and size channels, channelized road ditches that kind of took a lot of the water from the creek, uh, and then uh, drained riparian wetlands. So things were disconnected from these wetlands. And you can see a couple of the pictures of what the before conditions looked like. Not all of them looked horrible, uh, but there was a lot of areas that were less than optimal. And we had areas that were just disconnected from floodplains. So even where the stream was somewhat stable, it was disconnected from the floodplain. We wanted to establish a fishery for an Eastern brook trout. This is native to Eastern US and requires cold, clean streams and requires connectivity to the floodplains. We need to have this uh, connection to the floodplains and slow release of cold water uh, through groundwater. And then the populations uh, introduced in 2018 were to be monitored long term. So in 2018, we wanted to reintroduce, we reintroduced fish to the system. So this will talk a little bit about what happened on this project. There were three phases of the project. The first phase uh, started design in 2004. Uh, and it was a 600 linear foot project that was constructed uh, in the spring of 2006. Um, phase two was constructed in the fall of 2007 and it was a uh, 1,500 foot stream enhancement and 1,800 foot of stream restoration. And then phase three was constructed um, for 1,500 feet in the fall of 2009. Uh, phase one, uh, we dealt with a lot of step pools on this system. It was a 6% slope, and we wanted to do a priority one restoration on a 6% slope. We also had a culvert replacement that was buried and just prevented. Uh, it's a perch culvert. It would have prevented migration of brook trout upstream and downstream. So the first thing we did was a culvert replacement. We used a squash culvert, and then we used a series of cross veins downstream of the culvert to allow for fish passage. And it still was quite a jump, <clears throat> but it allowed for um, easier access to fish upstream. So this is what this culvert looked like two years later. Uh, and you can see that it was constructed with a, with a rock that was almost pink in color. And then in a 2016, uh, 10 years later, you can barely tell that the structures are there. So it's kind of, the vegetation has become more established and with the vegetation become more established roughness has increased and you have less of a drop over the structures. The priority, this priority one restoration um, dealt with a section of the old channel and we basically realigned a new channel and filled in the old channel uh, and we tried to fill in the old channel completely in this location because it was a six percent valley slope. The channel bed was lifted four feet uh, and there was a bog turtle uh, habitat restoration that was done on the left bank of the channel um, as well. The channel realignment, uh, we excavated a new channel in the dry. More State Environmental uh, had done this, done the construction of this project. The first year of this project, uh, they used no survey grade GPS uh, just because it was early in the process for them. And by 2007, the second year, they were running survey grade GPS for 
their construction of the stream restoration project. Uh, 2006, this was right before they had GPS installed on their equipment. So we use log drop structures. This is one of the first time that we use log drop structures. And very simply, the reason we used them is because we couldn't fit boulders into the reach. It was such a steep slope at 6% slope, we had to have pool to pool space about one and a half times the uh, river width. And with that pool to pool space and the boulders we had were so big that we couldn't fit boulders in to this stream and actually have pools in between there. So here's a picture of Dan Clinton supervising uh, the uh, installation of these log uh, step pool systems. These log drop step pools, when we installed them, uh, Greg Jennings' exact words to Dan Clinton and I was, I don't think they're gonna work, but I guess if they fail, we can just call it research. Uh, and while well, we were at the at NC State, which is pretty funny. Uh, what they what we found out over the years is they, they did not fail. They have been incredibly successful. Uh, and I look forward to seeing this one in 20 years because I have a feeling that we're still gonna find logs there 30 years after construction. Um, just the way that they're degrading and decaying right now. Some of these logs and these log drops are just not decaying very quickly at all because they stay wet. But they strongly encouraged hyperbaric exchange uh, and they gave us some great control that was needed. This is a little bit what it looked like right after construction. Uh, you can see that the rocks, <clears throat> we had native plants, uh, biodegradable mat on it, just to give us short-term stability. Uh, we came out in our riparian plan and we transported planted a whole bunch of ferns, this was Jess, we transplanted the ferns and Bill Swartley, um, and we transplanted a lot of native trees and shrubs from upstream with Karen Hall's assistance and direction. And then we also came in with wheelbarrow loads of substrate from the old channel before we filled in the old channel. So we went down to the old channel and we had interns, which is kind of like slave labor. Uh, so, and uh, these were students and they went out and they filled up wheelbarrow loads and they brought them over the stream and we inoculated the new stream with the wheelbarrow loads of cobble and gravel and organics from the existing channel. Uh, this probably would have been recovered quicker if we did it from upstream where the, the thymic, where the benthos were stronger, but we did it from the old channel. Uh, this is what the substrate looked like. This project was constructed in 2006. This is five years later the amount of moss and detritus that's built up on these rocks <clears throat> in just a short uh, five-year period. And this is what the stream looked like five years later. It looks very natural. You see a lot of moss growing up. You see a lot of vegetation on the rocks. Uh, this is 10 years later on some of the log drop structures. You can see it looks like downed logs. It doesn't look like an engineered system. Uh, the banks have become well stabilized with vegetation as well. So phase two and three was downstream. We moved away from some high terrace bank erosion uh, and we hydrated a wet meadow by reconnecting this channel that was incised. We used, it got a little bit flatter between a two to 3% slope. So we used more log and boulder riffles cascades. Um, and this is where we used, experimented with the idea of log riffles and uh, uh, boulder constructed riffles. In phase three, was constructed in 2009. Uh, with the construction of phase three in 2009, <clears throat> we moved the channel away from being being right up against the road where it functioned as a roadside ditch. And we moved it away from the roadway so it gave us more of a buffer. The channel realignment and connectivity, um, we did most of the work offline and then we tried to stabilize before it turned the water into the new channel so we allowed it to vegetate up before it turned water into the new channel. Uh, and then we used log and boulder veins and riffles instead of the log steps because we didn't have quite as steep as, as a drop and we wanted to get more bug production out of the riffles. So in 1998, uh, before we did any work out here, uh, this is what the stream looked like. And you could see the stream the entire way down through the valley. There was not much buffer on it. Um, <clears throat> and it's dark colored because of the shame of how incised the reach was at the time time. Um, and uh, by 2008, we had done the restoration on phase one and phase two. We hadn't done it yet on phase three. But you can see how right after construction, there's not veg much vegetation 
uh, in the sections that was just constructed in 2007 or 2006. By 2009, uh, we started to see revegetation. We had the phase three that was completed on the lower end of the project. And with phase three being constructed on the lower end of the project, uh, by 2013, we started to see revegetation uh, throughout the entire uh, buffer. And we had this big buffer that came back by 2013. Uh, 2019, which is the most recent aerial photography, you can see uh, what's becoming a more mature forest uh, buffer on either side of the channel. Um, in 2018, there was enough uh, shade in the channel and the water temperatures were cool enough, finally, that they were able to reintroduce rook trout to the system from adjacent systems. So they were monitoring this to make sure the morphology was good, to make sure there wasn't much bank erosion. They were monitoring to make sure that the temperature was good uh, and then the macro invertebrates had recovered. And this was a slow recovery, uh, but it did meet all success criteria by Dave Penrose for that he had set out in North Carolina. It's one of the few projects in North Carolina that had actually met the success criteria. Uh, and uh, if we would have inoculated from upstream uh, and from a reference reach upstream, we might have had a little bit quicker response, but we did get a response. And we say it's re it was recovered slowly to match the upstream reference, but at the same point, it wasn't that slow. I mean, it was in 10 years, we've seen a recovery in this system. Uh, and in 10 years, we were able to reintroduce Eastern Brook trout and they are reproduced. And we just got word a couple of weeks ago that uh, the state of North Carolina went back out and they have sampled small brook trout and can verify that there is successful reproduction. There are successful reds in the system and that it seems at this point that it's going to be a sustainable uh, native brook trout uh, population. Um, the population was taken from two nearby creeks, so in, in higher elevations, uh, places that weren't uh, as impacted, uh, and the monitoring uh, in 2020 documented the fish growth and reproduction. So there'll be long-term monitoring with this project in North Carolina. Um, the goals and objectives of this project were achieved. Uh, we've almost eliminated bank erosion. There's very little movement for bank erosion here. Uh, there's a lot of undercut banks, a lot of undercut structures. Uh, floodplain and wetland functions uh, has been restored, so there's a lot more wetland function for habitat. There's also bog turtle habitat on the property now. Uh, one of our uh, sponsors were quails and bog turtle people. Uh, and then there's repairing vegetation that support is supporting a buffer function. So there has been successful reintroduction of brook trout. That doesn't mean that we're done yet. It doesn't mean that it's going to be successful long term. Uh, we're going to, they're going to keep on monitoring and seeing kind of what, um, if it stays to be re, uh, successful reproduction or not. So some of the keys to success were really just reconnection of that floodplain, getting that groundwater inter interaction, having a longitudinal connectivity uh, between the streams. So being able to remove those drops, being able to allow uh, fish to pass between reaches, between deep pools from one reach to another reach. Um, we have geomorphic diversity now between riffles, pools, glides, and steps and meanders, and that's really valuable because we don't completely understand where brook trout need to live at all the different stages of their lives, but we know that when we get a diversity of habitat, it gives them more opportunities to live in different places. Uh, and then we uh, incorporate a lot of wood into this system, so we found new ways to deal with wood. We never used log steps before this. Uh, the idea of a log step was first um, used as an experimentation on this project, and we use them a lot now. Um, riffle sills and log uh, riffles, uh, is something that was new that was created on this project that we hadn't used before. So we tried to take the idea of a rock and roll riffle, but just use only logs into it. Um, brush toe and brushy riffles were used on this project. So we used riffles just made out of brush. And then we used the toe of banks that was just stabilized with brush. Uh, when we started this project, there was no idea of a toe wood uh, at that point. Uh, we, we started using brush in different ways because we were reading things from Janine Castro and others 
from the Pacific Northwest saying how important the use of large wood was in the systems. And then transplanting and tree planting. Uh, we had already been doing this a lot, but we did a lot more attention to this. And North State with the use of survey grade GPS was able to do clear and grub in, in a different manner. So they were able to use a lot more transplants on this than they had ever had before. And even the last 10 years since then, uh, North State Environmental has been doing a lot more transplants on projects um, and taking real care of transplants. And it has been a real benefit to a lot of these projects that we've done. And then just woody debris accumulation. So making things that are rough, that can catch wood as it falls down the system, making margins of the system that can catch wood uh, so we can have leaf packs and we can have woody debris that accumulates in these systems even uh, when it wasn't designed in the system. So those are some of the things that have been valuable through this through this rendezvous mountain uh, state park. We could probably spend uh, 20 minutes talking about a lot of different concepts of this down the road, uh, but I wanted to introduce the project for you. I wanted to show you a project that I think everybody involved has claimed as being a, a true success project. Even some of the biggest critics has considered this to be a real success. Uh, for a restoration project. So. Do you have any comments or thoughts about uh, this project or any questions about, hey, did you do this or did you do that? Dave, Ms. Brad, you got a question on the riffle sills. Are you putting them at the top of the riffle or at the bottom of the riffle? So on these, on these projects, we did riffle sills at both the top and the bottom of the riffle, uh, but we okay. migrated to doing, doing them at the bottom of the riffle after this project. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is we've seen a little bit of widening of channels in the first couple of years after construction by putting them at the head of the riffles. Thank you. There's, there's some really good pictures of wood in here, Dave. I'll probably want to borrow some of those photos at some point, so I'll reach out to you, okay? Yeah, and I have I have a non-compressed version. This one I compressed all the pictures to uh, 96 DPI just so that uh, it could email out. So I have a better one I can send to you, Brad. Thanks, man. Take care. Yep. Hey, Dave, Josh. Um, I can't see the pictures right now. Uh, I've seen the project. Um, that was a really uh, you guys really pioneered some stuff and stepped out, and there was a lot of. Uh, a lot of different stakeholders or partners or, or people who supported that. Um, tell me a little bit more about the, the, um, the stakeholders. Uh, who, who was the project sponsor and how was it funded? It was. It seems, if I if I recall, it was a little unusual. Yeah. So um, the project was funded by the Clean Water Management Trust Fund. Uh, they were the primary sponsor, and there was money from the North Carolina Forest Service as well, as well as there were some extension grants through the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service uh, through NC State. Uh, so there was a lot of um, a lot of little funding agencies that kind of came together and joined joined things together. But the big funder was Clean Water Management Trust Fund, uh, and then uh, the extension had wrote that with the help of the U.S. of the North Carolina Forest Service. You know, I just uh, as a matter of acknowledgement, I, 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 I think uh, I should go uh, recognize that Clean Water has really done a tremendous job at supporting uh, practice advancements in, in North Carolina. It has and that, you know, this this project and other similar type projects have really uh, you know, it's not like a lot of times you do work for a municipal client and they're like, this is the way we want to do it, or, or a federal or, you know, other clients. Or, you know, I just I, I just think it's a good opportunity to shout out. Added words of encouragement uh, to, to that process and that collaborative effort. So, great project. That's neat. It's, it's, it's really old. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat to have a 10-year-old project that you can look at and learn something from. Um, you know, we have the project partners, and I know I know that this project partners is not exhaustive. I mean, uh, uh, North State had given a lot of time <clears throat> on this project that I don't think they were ever adequately compensated for. And Daryl was just really passionate, and Brandon Spa were just really passionate about doing an amazing project on here, and that that was a real help too. 
uh, Stantec uh, consultant, um, Brad Fairley and Mike Geenan, uh, just donated a lot of time and effort towards helping out, especially with the latter two phases of this project, uh, because um, a lot of the design team had, had not been at the university anymore, uh, and we were helping the next group of people uh, to do the design uh, that uh, were kind of there after other people had left. So I know there's a lot more people than what shows up on the, the thin, uh, but you know, one of the values of a project like this is uh, somebody like Greg Jennings was able to encourage people uh, and empower them to get that many people to come together. And I think that's incredibly powerful. You know, it's, it's one of those things that is overlooked a lot of times that, you know, kind of finding ways to encourage people and getting people excited about something so they're willing to kind of put time and effort towards a project, even if the budget's not quite there. But it was a, it was not a high budget project. They had to find a lot of funds from a lot of different areas to get the project done. Have you fished it? I haven't fished it yet. No, I probably someday I'll I'll probably uh, go back there someday and contact the people and ask if I can fish it. Uh, but um, uh, for the time being, I'd probably be more interested in electro fishing it with them some year just to monitor it. So yeah, you could get Bill, your boat captain, to come check it out and fish it. That would lift him up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm not sure. I'm I'm pretty sure that those brook trout would be embarrassing to him. So, <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Nice project. All right. Well, guys, have a great week this week. Um, if you have, if anybody wants to stay on the line and discuss anything, feel free to. Um, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week if you can make it. Dave, can I chat with you about Elmore? Sure, go ahead. Um, so a bunch of stuff went on yesterday. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to I'm trying to get back to stuff so you can see me now, right? I can, yeah. Yeah, okay, I can't see you, but that's fine. For some reason, my screen is not showing. But anyway, um, so yeah, this this was this was great, Dave, because I'm. I'm trying to do a couple of presentations on use of wood and, and its benefits in terms of fish production. So I'm, I, some of this would be great and, and some of the, the stuff from Billy Atkinson would be really good as well. So um, anyway, um, so basically we had the meeting with the client and they were all on board with everything in terms of the, the plugging the gap at the north end. So that's good. So we're, we're all right with that. I will check with uh, TTL to see if they need any help with that uh, bioengineering portion downstream, you know, like I know they can build the sill, but I don't know whether they can tie it in properly, Dave. Okay. So I'll, I'll let you know if we want to do some design work on that, if you want to have uh, Luis or somebody to help with that. Um, the other thing is 3A, where you were cutting a little bit of floodplain. So one of the questions was, Everybody was pretty much on board with it, but then the guy from EPA said, or, well, actually, it was Department of Justice, which is really scary because he, he doesn't really know much. But he, it was a legitimate question he asked. He said, well, why are we trying to save this berm? Why don't we just get rid of it and the road and just tear it all out and just let the stream access the floodplain? Well, uh, Terrell tried to add some value, and he said, well, the reality is, is that there's um, – it's not that simple in the sense that the on the right bank, um, it's it's uh, you know that a lot of that material has been deposited, and he thinks his point was that even if you cut it down to the existing ground, he said he's not sure the stream would access that right side of the floodplain because the whole channel is so desperately incised. So what Chris suggest, and I, I'm curious whether you think that's a fair point. I don't know whether you've you've looked at the data. Um, yeah, I I agree with him. I mean, it's not going to get, it's still going to be incised. Yeah, okay. Over there so, so Chris was wondering if we if we showed. I mean, basically, what you did was you altered the existing cross section that TTL had provided. So Chris was wondering if we drew one that you'd surveyed where, because basically you didn't in the cross section that TTL had, we didn't show the left bank that was equally high. You know what I mean? It was basically. Yeah. 
So basically what, what Chris was suggesting was if we show a, reg, a real cross, <laughs> did you go over the right bank and go down on the other side, Dave, or just go to top of bank? We did. We went down on the other side. So we okay, have so, so you've got an elevation for the other side. So basically what Chris is suggesting is we can show them what the cross section looks like accurately and then say, look, even a, you know, a 50 year event's not going to access this floodplain, but what it is going to do, it's going to create the opportunity for a lot of that unconsolidated super fine material potentially to, to, to drain into the creek during, you know, rainfall events where you basically start and give it access to flow down into the creek. So Anyway, so Chris was wondering if we could draw up a cross section that would show sort of the what, you know, how deeply in size that is, and that even at significantly high flows, we're not accessing the floodplain, but we are creating an opportunity for crap to come in from those old settling ponds into the stream. Yeah, what we can do is we can uh, we can draw the that that existing channel, and then we can propose what we would do for the. For the bank but then we can also put on the water surface elevation at the different stages for the 100 year or the 50 year perfect and then that's, that's exactly make it pretty evident yeah so yeah, that's what we want to show is that basically if we cut that down it's all downside there's no upside you know we're not going to get water out but we're going to allow the fines to flow in so that's right that's, that's right anyway so if you could work on that that would be great if you want to have Luis do that i don't really care um whatever. so that's that's kind of where we are and then the third, so the, the one thing is I'll verify whether TTL wants help with the design for tying the sill into the upstream area. Um, they've decided, pretty sure they don't want to move that channel in, at, the, the diver, at, the, at the breach. They just want to leave it where it is and, and put that sill in, okay? Okay. Um, so I'll verify that. And then basically, if you can give me the new cross section for zone 3A, and then I'm wondering, so this is, all of that is for uh, US EPA and DOJ. The other thing is, I think I sent in one of my previous emails, I'm wondering, can you basically, Dave, take zones one, two, and three, and because you had different priorities and different types of restoration that were going to be done based on how poor the channel was. And I was suggesting you put color coding along the channel alignment to show in this area, we're just doing repairing and treatment. In this area, we're doing so. Basically, what I'd like is a figure that matches up with the table because you had you had broken down certain so many feet of this, so many feet of this. Can can we see that on the map? Yeah, we can do that. That would really help because basically, I got to break the bad news to Elmore that you know the channel's in pretty bad shape and it needs quite a bit of work and. This is what we're recommending, and and I liked your I, when I asked you about whether we could phase it. You said we could, so I'd like to, you know, offer it up and said, look, and it can be done in stages if you'd like. But and then you even said there was a couple of reaches, yeah, I don't know, 1,800 feet or something, where you didn't think much needed to be done at all. So I think it would be yep. good if you could see that. So, um, and I think you've got base figures to draw on for, for zones one, two, and three. If you don't, let me know, and I'll get Dave Coffrin to send you something. I'm not sure you – have you got zone three? I'm not sure I've got zone three myself. Uh, we have <coughs> we have stuff that we can create figures for zone three. Well, they, but they've, they've already seen – you know those color-coded ones that we had with the restoration plan on it? So yeah. that, that's – so, so basically, I'll make. Let me. I'm going to ask Dave Coffrin for the most up to date versions of those. Those. I think they had zones one and two on one figure, and I think that zone three on another figure. So I'll check and get the most up to date. But if you could translate your table for different types of treatment. So if you're just doing, you know, if you're cutting a floodplain bench, then you know, make those sections blue. And if you're cut, if you're just doing repairing treatments, make those sections purple. And, you know, basically, and there's a section up at the top that's going to be realigned. So make that a different color and just put a, you know, quarter inch, half inch tone over the channel just so that they can relate it to what, what the treatment's going to be. Okay. And okay. I think what I'm going to do is uh, for the places where we're not actually adjusting the channel, I'm just going to try to put that buffer on the side of the channel so it doesn't look like we're actually doing anything to the channel okay so uh, I'm, I'm, really I'm okay with I'm okay with how you want to represent it but that you know what I'm trying to get at basically I just want them to understand that we're doing different things in different places based on your assessment yeah, that sounds good um, and all uh, there's 
I'm, I'm having to do a little bit of background work related to, um, we thought that EPA understood what the restoration plan is, but they don't seem to understand it. So we're gonna go back around it again. So I may come back and ask for some help with another figure or ask for clarification, but I'm, I've got to talk to Chris Terrell and get some clarification as to what we're doing because the idea is, is that we, we, you know, they keep saying, well, you need to do the floodplain connectivity. And I said, well, why do we want to do the floodplain connectivity in zone two? I said, we probably don't want floodplain connectivity because we don't want the channel breaking out. And so they said, well, we don't know what you're planning on doing. And I said, but you do, you've had the figures. And so there was a <laughs> on the phone and, and after it was all over, the guy from, from Nutter, who's basically helping EPA phone back and he apologized to Chris Terrell. And he said, you know, I, I think we do have everything that you've sent us and that we do have under, but he said, for some reason, it's not sunk in with these people, what it is we're proposing. So, but in the meantime, if you could, I'll clarify on zone one uh, on the, on the breach, whether they want some help with, I don't know, typicals or, you know, maybe maybe a little bit more detailed, Dave, in terms of, you know, what what it's going to look like, something like that. Um, and the yeah. last section for Zone 3, that's for EPA. And then the other one with the the colors, that's going to be for uh, Elmore Sand and Gravel cause TT, because uh, EPA doesn't need to understand what's going on in each little section. So I'm hoping to have a figure that kind of goes with your table that you put together with the costs. Okay? Okay. What's your um, what's your timeline for each one of these tests? Um, basically, end of the week, early next week. Okay. Yeah, that shouldn't be too bad. You can have somebody get that done, can't you? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Luis, do you, uh, I'll probably get you working on three A here. Uh, if you have time downtime today, you can get started on three A. If not, you can work on it tomorrow when you have downtime. So. Okay, that sounds good. So you'll, you'll just take you'll take the cross section that we had uh, that we had surveyed when we were out there and just redo the cross section that you did for three A with the true true cross section on opposed to the cartoon. Uh, okay, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, give give me a buzz. We'll discuss it. Okay. Okay. That's it. That's it for me, guys, for the short term. So thanks for the help. Um, and. Uh, so we we did okay. Um, I do, the the conference was interesting. Dave, did you go to any of it or not? Um, I ended up not going to it by mistake because I thought it was on Mountain Time and I didn't look at that. So I, <laughs> I was set up there. I was set up there. I would, I went on a Mountain Time. I was like, nobody's here. Nothing's happening. And then I looked at them. And I was like, ah. Oh. But I did talk to Greg right after that, and he said the only person he talked to was uh, George, who was one of the other people in the booth. So. Uh, he thought it was a little bit of a bust. So. Yeah, we didn't get much traffic at all. I, I think, um, and, I, and I did my presentation, which took a lot of time. And apparently it was kind of interesting because you basically, you download it, you watch the presentation whenever you wanted. And then yeah. your time was actually for people to pop in and ask questions. Um, and yeah. so I, other, than, other than Greg popping in to say he listened to the talk and blah, blah, blah. Then I had one other guy, a mitigation banker from California, who gave me a call and was interested in, was interested in moving to, to Canada, as apparently there are a number of people interested in moving to Canada these, these days. <laughs> um, it's, a, more, it's getting more and more popular as the election gets near. I think if Trump gets in, I think there'll be mass exodus, but we'll see. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for the help, Dave. Baseball. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be back in touch with anything more as soon as I get some stuff cleaned up. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Brad. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Louise. Thanks for the help last week. Oh, you're welcome. Dave. Hey, Louise, you still there? Yes. Uh, can you send me the table that Brad's talking about? I haven't seen anything for that oh yeah about the uh the stuff for the 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 cost of each reach yeah i can i yeah. can send that to you i had copied you last week on it so okay i'll send i'll send you that so are you going out to do drone photos and look at uh look at a uh, willow branch today 
I think so. I'm just going to go in a little bit and just check it out, what's going on, and kind of set up a plan with Joseph about what needs to be done. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see Willow Branch uh, reach eight, which is the one down WRP. They should be done with it by now. So I'd like to see how, how that looks from a drone. Yeah, I'll, I'll go and take some pictures and put it in the Dropbox. Great. Great. Yeah, they were... They were doing, they were, man, it was amazing to watch it two weeks ago. Kind of, it just looks so different right now. And they have the plug, a lot of plugs filled in. Um, and it just doesn't even look like the same place. It's been great. Well, I'm, um, I'm going to go out right now <laughs> before it gets too hot. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good, man. We'll talk to you later today. I'll be traveling to California. Feel free to give me a buzz whenever I should be available in the evenings if you, if you want to get together early in the evening late in the evenings or early in the morning. So. Okay. That sounds good to me. Hey, we'll see you. Thanks a lot, man. I'm glad you got down there safely. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye.